We have traveled all over Kenya to find hard-working farmers. We want to celebrate them while giving them the help they need to improve their farms, get better yields, and build profitable businesses. We will see how farmers from across the region can benefit from our experts' advice, while also learning from each other in so many ways. Join us on these journeys and share in the farmers' experiences as they shape up their shambas. Karibu to the Shamba Shape Up Safari. Welcome to Shamba Shepherd. Today we are just outside Eldoret in Wasingishu County. And we are visiting farmer Sarah Kemboy. She's an excellent farmer who is a great role model to women farmers. But she would like to expand her business further and would like expert advice with her dairy cows. And so we brought not one, but two experts to help her with her cows. Let's go and meet her and see what the experts have to say. Let's go. And this is Sarah Kimboy. Her husband works as a manager on a farm nearby. But at harvest time, she's not alone. When they're not at school, her children are happy to help out. Sarah. Ah, there you are. How are you? I'm fine. Mm? <laughs> ah, so uh, we are here. Show us your shamba. Welcome. Okay. Let's go. Bye. Sarah grows potatoes. She's just harvested the maize. And of course, she has dairy cows. Very beautiful shamba, Sarah. Well done. You're doing great. But in every shamba, I'm sure there are problems here and there. Now, how can Shamba Shape Up help you today? Okay, with the cows, I wish you could help me improve the breed. Oh. Because I've not got the yield which I, I really yearn for. Mm. Mm. We can do something about that. I think so. Okay. Okay, on the potatoes, I have a problem with the pests and diseases. Uh -huh. Another challenge that I have here is the lighting. When you see Shamba Shape Up here, we come with experts. So if you'll excuse us, we need to pitch up our tent and get to work. Bye. Bye bye. Okay. <laughs> All right, we'll see you later. See you. All right. So let's pitch the tent and get ready for work. Tony. Yes, Caro. Ah, oh, so are you ready to shape up our farmer? Definitely I am, Caro. And we have not one, but two experts on cows. Yes, one with advice on breeding with AI to get stronger, healthier cows. And another to make sure the calves reach breeding stage as quickly as possible. But first, I'm going to find out about the potatoes. And I'm going to see about lighting the house. See you later. See you later. On the way to my first expert of the day, there was some good news. The soil test results have arrived. Getting the right balance of nutrients in the soil can make the difference between getting a poor harvest and a very good harvest. And we have discovered her soil is very low on calcium. It's acidic. So she needs to add lime. Let's find our farmer and give her the news. Our first expert today is Eric from Osho. Sarah's potatoes are not doing well. So, we've asked her to tell us what's wrong and see if Eric can help. I had a problem with the pests. Initially, when the crops were just sprouting, mm -hmm. the cutworm really destroyed. Aha. Another challenge is uh, diseases. There is this blight okay. which really affected. But I tried so much uh, spraying, mm -hmm. which costed me a lot of money. All right. Yeah. To begin with, uh, I've managed to get uh, two or three pests. The first pest is the white flies, mm -hmm. and uh, the second pest is uh, cutworm, and uh, the third pest is uh, tuber moth. So how will you identify that uh, the, the white flies are in your field? Mm -hmm. Definitely you will have to shed the, the leaves right. and you will see the flies moving up and down. Uh, yes. Uh -huh. When you go down and start uh, scratching the soil or opening the soil where the potato is growing from, you will be able to get the cutworm there. All right. Yes. And then for the tuber moths, I know as you approach harvesting, you will see some holes drilled on the potato. And how can you help me control this? I have two chemicals here with me. 
One is nimbecidine and another one is finoflight. Finoflight plus nimbecidine will make sure that there will be no white flies in this field. This chemical that we call it nimbecidine is a biological insecticide. It will break the resistance. You see, you might have been using a lot of drugs, a lot of chemicals, and the results were very poor because of resistance. But when you introduce this together with this one, and then definitely the resistance will, will not be there. When do you do the spray? The spraying should be done in the morning or very late in the evening. How about uh, in the fall? If the investigation of the pest is bigger, and then definitely I would recommend that you do it twice in a week. But they are, if there are not many, once in a week will be enough. To get rid of pests like catworm, whitefly and tuber moth, mix 50 ml of nimbecidine with 8 grams of final flight in 20 liters of water. Spray the crop, making sure the leaves are well covered both on top and below. Spray in the morning or the evening once a week. So uh, let's go to the diseases. So for diseases, the first disease is a uh, potato cyst nematode. Potato cyst nematode has become a very big challenge. But today I will show you the most simplest way of diagnosing the potato cyst nematodes. Mm -hmm. First and foremost, when you uproot your crop that has just withered like this one, you will go definitely to the roots. And these roots have some gulls. Uh, one of those gulls will make the, the whole root system not to perform its function. So when the roots are definitely affected, this crop will not be able to get the nutrients from the soil. And you will see the crop withering. Are we there? Eric, what is the remedy? The first product that I have here is called bionematode. And then the second product is called nimbecidine. How do you also use this? You soak the seeds onto the mixture of the two chemicals and then you plant them. Immediately the crop has sprouted. You can also decide to, to spray onto this crop every month, every month. And that one you'll be able to control the nematodes. Soak the potatoes before planting in a mixture of bio nematon and nimbecidine. Then once the plant has sprouted, spray once a month. Combine 20 milliliters of bio nematon with 50 milliliters of nimbecidine in 20 liters of water. Sarah's final problem is potato blight. And Eric has a solution for this too. And these are the signs for blight. You've seen the leaf turning to be yellow yeah. and then drying up. Definitely we have a solution for this. And today I was able to come in with a product called Matko. Matko 72. So, for the potato blight, spray every month with Matko 72. Use 50 grams in 20 liters of water. Follow Eric's advice and say goodbye to pests and diseases in your potato crop for good. With the potatoes sorted, it's time I took Sarah to meet our next expert, Anne from Azuri. Sarah is paying a lot of money to light the house at night. And so we've asked Anne to explain how Azuri's solar home lighting system can help. So Sarah, uh, please tell the expert the problems you're having with your lighting. We don't have enough light, okay. actually, because I have school calling children who like to do their homework in the evening. So in that case, I use a lantern lamp. And it also causes some pollution, mm -hmm. which is not good for the children. Okay. Right now, I'm using a generator which uh, is expensive yes. to run, and at times it breaks down. So in that case, I use a lantern lamp. When you mentioned about the generator, how much roughly do you spend, at least on a daily basis? I spend around 500 shillings. That's a lot of money. It mm -hmm. is a lot. And also there are repairs when it breaks down. Yes. That's another expense. Mm. And for entertainment, or to know at least what is happening in the country? No, I'm just in a blackout. Oh my goodness, that must be very hard. Anne, I'm sure you have a solution. Yes, Tony, I do have a solution. We have the Azuri Solar TV today that comes also with a solar panel. It comes with the lights, it comes with the torch uh, and the radio. 
as well as charging cables that she can use to charge her phones. How does it work? Uh, so with us is a solar panel. That's big. It's a 50 watt solar panel <laughs> that is able to power all these items. Yeah. That means you no longer have to buy petrol for your generator or be afraid when it breaks down of extra cost. Because remember you said you're spending 500 per day. The solar panel now is able to get the light from the sun and we're able to power our battery. Just show you how that works. So we have this wire that the cable that comes from the panel that you're going to mount to your roof mm -hmm. and we're able to connect it and you're able to store all the energy from the sun here. Um, so the next thing we have um, that is powered by the same uh, battery, we have the four bulbs. All right, these are very bright and uh, you also have an individual switch for this. And now we can press the switch and the light goes on. And remember you're using free power from the sun. No more kerosene for the lantern or no more petrol for the generator. And it's very bright. Exactly. Did you see that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. very bright. Very bright. Uh, we have a solar powered radio that is also charged from the same control panel, which is a battery. Wow. And it's the exact same thing that you do with your phone. So again, you do not have to worry when the generator breaks down. Uh, you're able to charge multiple types of phones within your household. Um, I also have a small surprise for you. I know sometimes you go out to the market and you're coming home late. So we'll have a small torch for you that you can carry in your handbag. Mm. And again, we just need to twist it and you're able to see as you're walking around. It's nice. Wow. Yes. Also solar. Yes, it's all solar powered as well. And now for the moment I'm sure you've been waiting for. Yes. I'm seeing a TV. Yes, Tony. We have a digital TV and you're able to get entertainment throughout the day. Now for the TV, how many hours can the family watch? When the battery is fully charged, you can watch up to six hours. So you see now there'll be lots of savings because now you're saving from the phone charging, uh, the petrol for your generator, kerosene for the lanterns, and also batteries for your radio. So there's a lot of savings on a daily basis. Okay, let's install it. All right, let's do it. The system is installed by Azuri Technical Team for free. It comes with a satellite dish, providing access to over 50 television and over 20 radio channels through one of the biggest satellite TV services available in Kenya. It can be paid for in cash or with a deposit of 4,999 Kenyan shillings, followed by one month advance payment and a further 130 Kenyan shillings weekly payments. So, where an average farmer might spend 60 shillings a day on paraffin, the Azuri system will cost 99 shillings a day. But this also includes a television, four lights, a radio, and a torch. And after the payments end, using the system is totally free. Ah, so we've learned how to avoid pests and diseases in potatoes. And about lighting the house. But on this farm, Sarah is the real expert. That's right. And we've asked her to share with us her top tip in farming. So what I would like to share with other farmers is that uh, one should have passion for whatever you are doing in the farm. And also you should be dedicated to the work which is going on. And as a farmer, you also have to be a good manager. You have to look at, pick in on the people who are working and uh, everything that is going on in the farm. So if farmers watching the program follow what I've said, uh, they are going to be successful. Excellent tip. Excellent. Coming up after the break. How to breed cows for improved quality. And how to get the cows to breeding stage as quickly as possible. <laughs> Welcome back to Shamba Shape Up. We are in Eldoret and we are visiting Sarah Kemboy. We want to find out about improving cows and getting them to breeding stage as quickly as possible. So, no time to waste. See you later. <coughs> Our next expert is Ken from Coopers. Sarah wants more milk from her cows. So, 
Ken has come to explain how getting a good milk yield begins at the breeding stage. If Sarah selects semen with the right characteristics for achieving high milk yield from a catalog such as CRV from Coopers, she can use artificial insemination or AI to gradually improve her cattle. But what are the best characteristics for increased milk yield? And are Sarah's cows good enough? What do you think of our cows? Uh, what I would like to tell Sarah is that different farms have different breeding objectives. So you need to develop a breeding objective as a farm. So you find that other farms would be breeding for, to sell cows, other farms would, would be breeding to sell heifers, and uh, other farms would be breeding for milk. As you've just said, you're also targeting milk production. Yes. And by looking at her cows, how can you help her? So let us have a look at the cows, then we can discuss from there. Okay. okay. Sarah, so if you look at this cow, this is a, a short cow and a small cow. So we can improve the stature of this cow, Sarah. The stature of the cow is an important characteristic because a big cow will produce more milk. So we look to breed from large cows. Which type of breed is this cow? Uh, that is Kanze. Uh, when breeding a uh, Cows, if you are breeding Gansies, you need to ensure that you have a pure breed. If you are breeding uh, Frisians, it should be a pure breed. Why is that? Tomorrow when you want to sell a cow, somebody would want a pure breed. And you will fetch more money when you have a pure breed than a mixed breed. Mm -hmm. If you look at this cow, Sarah, this could be a, a good height, but uh, you look at the pin bones. If you look at this and that, this one is, uh, on, is lower than the other one. So it's also a trait that can be improved. The pin bones should be balanced and white because this helps a cow to calf more easily and with fewer complications, breeding will be less expensive. This is a good cow, Sarah. You should be able to see three ribs in a good dairy cow. If you can spot three ribs, this means the cow is a good weight and the milk factory, the cow's stomach, will be a good size. You should be able to see the way the udder is well attached. So if you look at the height from here to here, that is what we call the udder attachment. Uh, you also have to consider the teeth placement. Udders should not be too long. If they are close to the ground, this increases the risk of infections such as mastitis. Those are traits that we can correct so that you have a good or an ideal dairy cow. Okay, good. Let's Thank see how you. we can improve uh, Sarah's stock to get a good cow, just like this one. Come on, let's chat. Sarah, when breeding, there are five parts to farm profit that you have to consider. And the first one is longevity. You have to choose a cow that will last longer in your herd so that you avoid culling issues. The other point is conformation. So you need a very good cow that looks good in the eyes of people, a beautiful cow. The other thing is health and fertility. You need to have a cow that has a good udder that is free from disease. The other point is reliability. These are cows that have been tested for a long period of time. So it's like a guarantee that you are getting a good cow. The last point is production. So you need to choose cows that will give you more milk in your farm. And more milk is more profit. A good dairy cow should be wedge shape. That is the first thing that you have to, to look. The other thing is that you have to look at how the feeds are positioned. You have to look at the other attachment. You have to look at even the position of the teeth and the teeth length. Those are some of the traits that will guide you, Sarah, when selecting a very good dairy cow. You need a CRV bull catalog from Coopers. This is a very good guideline in terms of breeding because all those traits are in this catalog. Wow, yeah. let's have a look at it. So, when selecting a cow from the Coopers CRV catalog, choose one that contains all the characteristics you're looking for in a high yield as they all contribute to getting a good yield. This include large udder, strong back legs, and longevity. Make sure your inseminator is well qualified and experienced. A failed insemination is expensive, delays breeding, and therefore delays getting that high milk yield the farmer is after. So Ken, how will a farmer tell that they made the right judgment in selecting the breed? When selecting the breed, you need to keep records. And uh, we have the dairy farmer's record book from Coopers that will help you to keep your records. The record book not only contains breeding records, it has all the history of the cow, including milk yields, feeds, 
visit to the vet's illnesses, treatments, calf production. It's the cow's personal logbook and helps the farmer judge the cow's value. And if you are selling, helps get a good price for the cow. Exactly. Thank you. Thank you so much. So, we've seen how using AI and a breeding catalog can help improve your dairy herd. But once the calf is born, what else can Sarah do to help ensure the calf grows quickly into a productive cow? I've asked Harrison from Unga to talk to us about the importance of feed. The aim is for newborn calves to reach breeding age in as little as 12 to 15 months. Let's see how this is made possible. As every farmer knows, a good foundation of a good milking cow mm -hmm. is the semen that you give. Make sure that you choose the right breed for the right dam that you have so that you have better results after that. Mm -hmm. Now the next stage that you go to is how you feed that cow to be able to reach the sexual maturity so that it can give you a calf that's at up to around 15 months. So I'll ask you, Sarah, what have you been feeding your calves? Okay, so the first thing is that I feed them with colostrum mm -hmm. from the mother. Mm -hmm. And then later I just give them milk. Uh -huh. There's nothing wrong with feeding the calf the milk, but the balance becomes in between the enterprise she's learning, she wants to sell the milk for money and also to maintain a healthy calf. Yes. Spray for is a milk replacer. This product, you are assured that one, it is free of contamination, two, it is consistent. Mm -hmm. The third thing, it is very hygienic. Nobody is touching, nobody is milking, nobody, no, no utensils are touching the milk. Also, it has very high protein required for faster growth, body development, and also very high energy in terms of lactose to be able to make the calf grow quickly and be able to reach the weight that we desire within a certain age. So in your opinion, do you think the cows at this stage uh, look good for their age? Or if maybe they were fed on this, they'll be looking much better? When I was inspecting, you might realize that your calf sometimes, they develop diarrhea, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. When you do a lot of milk. So it reaches a time this milk with all the fat in it, this animal cannot be able to absorb it. And the digestive system of the cow becomes infected and the cow just starts doing what? Diarrhea. Mm -hmm. So this is another advantage. You'll have very minimal incidences of the calf diarrhea and losing weight. Can I afford this uh, spray flow? The cost is relative to the benefits that you want to get. Because this spray flow, essentially, it should be equivalent to the value of the milk that you're selling. For most farmers, the cost of buying milk replacer for the calf is balanced out by the extra money earned from selling the mother's milk. How do we give spray for to our calves? Spray for is supposed to be mixed with clean water between 40 to 45 degrees, that is body temperature, mm -hmm. just like the cow's milk. All right. From five days, that is the first week, up to seven days, you give the calf six liters in the entirety, but you divide it into three portions, two liters in the morning, midday, and evening. Okay. As the calf grows, between one week and one month, it's supposed to be fed a total of seven liters. So you give 3.5 in the morning and 3.5 in the evening. All right. Yes. After preparing the mixture, how do I feed the calf? Feed it with a bucket feeder, the one which has a nipple, or bottle feed the calf. Essentially, you're supposed to feed the calf when the neck is elongated. Mm -hmm. It's supposed to make the spray for mixture to bypass the rumen straight to the last stomach above mesa where the absorption takes. The neck has to be looking up. Yes. So, remember, feed the calf a total of six liters of milk replacer a day, divided up into two liter portions fed three times a day. Morning, midday, and evening. After one week, and up to one month, increase to seven liters a day. Again, divided up into three portions, morning, midday, and evening. So are we only going to feed our calves uh, the spray for, or is there any other kind of feed that is suitable for them? This animal is genetically made to use forage. That's the feed that's supposed to utilize to convert it to milk and to other products that the farm expects from it. That's when we come in with another product, Fugo Calf Alewina Pellets. This feed is pelleted with very high protein, high energy, balanced vitamins and minerals. This is also supposed to be given, ideally, from the fifth day also. We need to trigger it to be able to utilize the forage. So that by the time, after two months, that calf is being fed hay only, it's going to be able to utilize that hay because the rumen is going to be able to do what? To break it down. Mm -hmm. How much should I give to the calf? The quantity gradually increases from half a kg per portion per day 
to one and a half kg up to the time you are going to be stopping the calf in a pellet. Advantages, very strong bone structure and very, very fast body weight gain. Is it okay for farmers to feed their calves the hay or fodder hand in hand with the calf winner pellets? At the same time in tandem, that calf should be given hay. And by the time that calf is hitting one month, you find that it is, it's able to take that hay and digest it and utilize it as a feed. Are you satisfied? Yeah. Are you happy? So, I'm happy. So Sarah, time has come to go back to the tent, beat Tony, and we need to gauge whether our shape up has been of help to you. Okay. Let's go. Ah, there you are, there You're you back. are. Please sit, sit, sit. Thank you, thank you, Tony. Well, Shamba Shape Up has been in your farm. Now tell us, how did you like the experience? Actually, I've learned a lot from the expert. Yes. So when you come back, your Shamba will have moved to the next level. Yes, definitely. Good. Nice, yeah. nice. So, Sarah, are you going to be calling us? Yes, I'll be calling you frequently. Ah, good. We are going to give you a record book so that you know whether your Shamba is making a profit or loss. But I'm sure you're going to make profit. You know, our work here is done. So we'll see you in, in the, the next, next Shamba. Shamba.